Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. Welcome, everybody, to our Good Friday service. Yeah. Wasn't worship, like, off the hook? It was awesome. Thank you, worship team. You guys blessed my heart. I needed that this evening. So as I was preparing for this uh, Good Friday message, I, I got to tell you, it brought me back to when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was in this great program called Sunday School. Who remembers Sunday School? Who was in Sunday School? If you don't know what Sunday School is, it's kind of like Christian education on Sunday before service, and then you went to school, and then you went to service, then you went to kids' ministry, and then there was like Sunday School again on Wednesday, and then again on Friday, and I just kept learning, and, and then, man, Good Friday came, and I remember as a little kid, they were like, Good Friday, let's celebrate it, and you know, I, I just remember this moment, it stands out to me, and I was like, what's Good Friday? Everybody was like talking about it, some people were like sad, some people were happy, and, and then they began to share what Good Friday was, Now I was really little, I don't even know how old I was, I just remember the conversation, and I thought, that's not good, <laughs> like, do you, Jesus died, somebody died, like, how could that be good? And my compassion as a little kid was like, no, that's not good. Now, the problem is I had high compassion, low understanding. What I began to understand as I got older was really the price that he paid. Understanding that it may have not seemingly been good for Jesus, but it was incredibly good for you and I. I mean, how good is Good Friday? How good is this moment? And, and, and just to understand, this actually goes back to the early church. They actually celebrated the Lenten season, uh, what we call Holy Week, um, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, all the way in the first century. Like, this goes all the way back. What is Ho Holy Week? Holy Week starts for us on Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday. It was Jesus' triumphant en entry into Jerusalem. And it brought us to Holy Thursday, which is like the middle of, of the week, just yesterday. And that's when, Jesus, when it's com commemorated. Jesus' Last Supper, which Pastor Angel walked us through today doing communion together. And it was that ordinance Jesus gave us. And he was showing us something that they did not yet understand. I mean, imagine that Jesus pulls up the bread. He's like, this is my body broken for you. Eat it. This is my blood poured out for you. Drink it. And everybody's like, yo, this dude's a cannibal. Like, he wants us to eat him, right? Like, the Bible actually says a whole bunch of people ran away, and then the, the fearless 12 were like, we're with you because you rose people from the dead. You did some great and amazing things. We've walked with you, but we have no clue what in the world you're talking about. But we're going to walk forward in faith. And what Jesus was then saying, right, another comment he makes is, hey, I'm going to grab the temple, and I'm going to build it in three days. And they had no clue what in the world he was talking about. All they know is that walking with Jesus was amazing. Some of us, right, we... We're raised uh, to believe that, right? If you're raised in the church, others, you may have not, may, you may not have an encounter with God yet, but you're like, hey, I'm in church, somebody invited me, and I'm hungry. I want to understand more about Jesus and his goodness. What's so good about Friday? So Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper uh, on, on Holy Thursday. Later on that evening, he finds himself in the Garden of Gethsemane on his knees in despair, Right? Jesus, may this cup pass from me, he said, because he understood what he was about to do that no one else did. And, I, and, and the three guys he brings with him, his three buddies, are like sleeping. He's like, can you just stay awake and pray? Like, I need you to pray. And they gave in to the flesh again. They fall asleep three times. And Jesus is like, would you pray? Because the hour is at hand. And they come in, they arrest Jesus. He paid a big price for you and I. And what they didn't understand is that Jesus was here to fight a battle that we could not even wrap our minds around. You see, we knew, they knew, that man was with sin. They also understood that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, put everybody in the same playing ground, that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No matter what you've done, whether you've lied, stolen, dishonored your parents, dishonored God, used the Lord's name in vain, we're all transgressors. Everybody in this room and everybody throughout all of history, and they thought, well, with my best efforts, maybe I can please God. 
With my hardest work, maybe I can achieve forgiveness of sins. Oh, no, that didn't do it. So what did the Old Testament uh, give provision for? Sacrifice. Man, we would sacrifice and blood would run, which would represent your blood because Scripture says the wages of sin is death. The only payment for sin is blood. And the reason why they had to keep sacrificing in the Old Testament over and over and over was because people kept sinning over and over and over, and there was no perfect lamb. There was only one that looked kind of good enough. And every time he was sacrificed, man, he may have sufficed God's anger and wrath for that moment, for those sins. But the moment that sacrifice was over and they sinned again, they stepped right back into distance with God. Right? So they had to sacrifice again. And Jesus understood what he was going toward, which was the cross. That perfect land slain. And that was the cost of your salvation. That amazing moment that they didn't understand. And these early followers of Jesus, they couldn't wrap their minds around that this king, this creator of the universe, came to free people, not from the bondage we think we're in, but from the bondage we don't actually see. And some of us today are walking in bondage we don't really see. Some of us, man, we... we, we do this Christian walk, this journey all year long, never really diving into really the foundation and the roots of the gospel. It's all about this moment, folks. You see, some of us had a talk with someone earlier today uh, before service, and they're like, what's greater, Good Friday or Easter? And I'm like, they kind of go together, right? Because if Jesus never died for sins, we wouldn't be forgiven. But if he never rose from the dead, we wouldn't know he was God and that he meant what he actually said. Like, the two go together, and that's why we celebrate what is called Holy Week, but it's not just for one time a year. It's for you to carry with you all the days of your life. Because what ends up happening is when you forget the gospel story, you end up resting back and going back to old habits, bad habits. Oh, it's by my best merit. It's, it's by my best effort. It's, man, somehow I'm going to try to run that race to be good enough and smart enough. How many of you know you can't even please the people in your life very long? God's not an angry God, right? He is, let me say this, God is, he's everything. Scripture says he's the great I am. And the Bible has over 950 plus names and titles of God. Every one of them is a promise. God is a judge. Let's not get that mistaken. He is holy and righteous. He has to judge sin and death, but he's also love. And he's given us this great season of grace that he paid our sin debt. And before it all comes to an end, he's like, as many of you as possible, please come to me. Choose me and I will give you forgiveness. All your shame, all your guilt, all of that is gone. It's like behind you. You don't need to bear it anymore. You're not who you think you are. You're not who they said you are. Jesus is like, you're who I say you are. You're my child. What you did is no longer before you. I wanna... So we're in this amazing season of grace that God has put his judgment for you and me on the shelf in order to extend his grace and mercy. This is our season, guys. This is our season to be right with God. It's our season to walk with God only made possible through Jesus, not best effort. That's why we're saved uh, by faith through grace and grace alone, which is the unmerited favor of God. Now, I got to tell you, I think we need to start this message. I know I, I started running, right? We, we need to slow back. We need to go back to the story. Let's read this together and just really paint the picture of what these early followers of Jesus were experiencing on this Good Friday, this horror, horrific storm they found themselves in. Mark 15, verse 16 to 37. You guys roll with me on this. So Jesus was arrested. We know that, right? The soldiers led Jesus away to the place that is named Petri uh, Petrium and called together the whole company of soldiers. A company of soldiers. You know how many were in a company of soldiers? Over 450 Roman soldiers were in one company. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on his knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his, uh, put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. Imagine 450 people striking and spitting on Jesus. Imagine getting pulmoned with all of those punches and those kicks and all of that abuse. Verse 22, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast, uh, they cast lots to see what each would get, right? They gambled his stuff between each other. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. 
Verse 29, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elio, Elio, lemma sabachi, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last breath and he died. And as I read the story, I was just thinking about how the early followers of Jesus must have felt. Like, this is a horrific storm. They, they didn't remember, right? We, we go back, you know, we could see the whole story. You and I look at John 15, and we're like, oh, Jesus prophesied he would raise. They didn't get that. All as they knew is, I gave up my life to follow this man. I gave up everything. I walked away from my business. I walked away from my home. I walked away from everything I had ever known. I've chosen poverty to follow him. And I thought what he was going to do for me. I thought what he was going to do for Israel. I thought what he was going to do to Rome. He was going to make all the wrongs right in my life and in my nation. And here he is, dead. What a horrible letdown. Here this man is, and this is the insults they paid him, right? They said here he was. He was able to raise others, but he can't raise himself. What a horrible setback. And for so many of us, we're sitting here on Good Friday and we got to recognize that this story is really a mirror of reality. It's a true story, founded in history, lots of eyewitnesses. This is facts. But it's also a mirror of the story of many of our lives, that all of us run into some hard times, right? This last few years, we're in this horrific pandemic. Everybody's scared to death of what's going to happen. Then the numbers kind of lift a little bit, and we find ourselves in possibly World War III. Gas prices are through the roof. Like, things are kind of bad. And yet, how many of you know Easter Sunday's coming? You see, what I love about this gospel message, it's not even the story of salvation for you and I, it's also the story of hope for your whole life, your eternal life and your life here. It helps us to recognize that in life, you're going to face many problems, many troubles in life, Scripture says. But have hope because if Jesus overcame, so will you and I. Now, as we look forward in that hope, because he rose, and we're going to talk about that in like two days, there's hope for you and I. But what does this part of this story mean to me? It means for us that we're not who people said we were. You're who God says you are. Do you know the amount of worth and value that you are to God? That he would pay that ultimate price for you, for your salvation, for that relationship? And so many of us settle for labels. So many of us settle for less. So many of us live life Believing in God, but living in guilt and shame. You see, that cross, that is completely empty because he rose, that cross represents the fact that you don't have to live that way anymore. Some of us even get into ministry because we're driven by guilt and shame. And if I'm just enough, if I just sing just good enough, if I serve just enough, if I preach just enough, somehow I'm going to please God. How many of you know I don't have to work to please God? Jesus did that for me. Jesus did that for you. It's not by your best effort. This is why you get to fall in love with Jesus because you don't have to perform anymore. You don't have to work hard anymore at trying to gain God's favor. He's already given that to you. So now live free. You know why I serve? Because he served first. You know why I give? Because I can't outgive God. It's an act of faith. Do do you know why I show up and I preach? Because I, I can't stop talking about Jesus. You see, when when you understand the gospel, you're no longer living good works. You're no longer living those works because you need to measure up. It's because your heart is so full. God is so good in your life. You're like, I just need to pour out. I just need somewhere to pour. I can't contain this joy and this peace that I have. But you know what's interesting? That joy and peace, it's discovered in a storm. It's discovered in a storm. Nobody ever encounters deep intimacy with God on that mountaintop. We don't because we lose perspective up there. You see, when I'm up on that mountaintop, just like all of you, we start to put our hope in wrong things. You put it in your education. 
You put it in your career. You put it in your family. Sifting sand. You put it in finances. Trying to make mom and dad proud of me. All of that is sifting sand. And then hardship happens. We fall off the mountaintop, find ourselves in a valley, and all of a sudden we cry out to God, God, would you rescue me? And in that moment, we experience him as the redeemer of our story. Praise God for hardship sometimes, all right? Storms. And you know what? As we all sit here, we're all in in the storm together, aren't we? I don't know what the future holds. COVID numbers are going back up. Things on the other part of the world are heating up. But you know what? I know who holds the future in his hand. You see, my hope is not in how things are going to turn out. I know how they're going to turn out because I opened the book. And you know what? I trust God. And you know what? When hardship happens, you know, we believe believe God's good, don't we, right? At least that's what Scripture says. His character is good. Do you know the goodness of God is not based on how you feel about God? The goodness of God isn't based on how you feel about your situation or about the world. Guys, I'm just as concerned as you but yet God is still good when the world isn't but what do I believe that he is a redeemer he is who he says he is and that somehow all of this in his sovereign will he's allowing it but he's going to use it for his good and his purpose you see there's strength in pain there's strength in pain and it's a gift to you and to me if you can discover the strength in pain because you know what the strength is the strength is anchoring into God's strength and not resting on your own ability, your own understanding, or the way things are going to turn out. Because you know what? No matter how it turns out, I know where I'm going. No matter what happens, I know he's my provider. I don't care how expensive gas gets, how many of you know God still provides? He does. When it's hard to give, and I'm like, honey, our finances are tight, but I want to give to that Feed the Children campaign. I can't outgive God. And I say that, God, I'm going to give out of what I don't have because I can't outgive you. Why? Because you're more generous than me. And you know what happens time and time again? The more I give, the more I serve, the more God shows up in my life. But I learned that in a storm. And this wasn't the first storm this early church encountered. Guys, we're in a storm today, just like the early church. But I'm going to tell you, the first storm they actually encountered is a story that's in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's in that boat moment. You see, they were following Jesus. He's doing great things. He's turning, man, water into wine. That was kind of cool, right? Invite Jesus to the parties, right? (laughs) He did that. Raised the dead. Healed the sick. Blind could see. The deaf could hear. They're following Jesus. And then Jesus brings them on a boat ride. Jump in with me, Mark 4, 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping, say sleeping, on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. You see, mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, all that stuff they experienced with Jesus, And they still didn't get it. You see, it was in that moment of a storm that they started to question and understand who he was. It was in that moment of storm and that pain that they're like, this guy, he's greater than who we think he is. And the story kind of reminds me of a a truth, that following Jesus is costly as well. You see, sometimes Jesus walks you into a storm, doesn't he? You see, in his sovereignty, in his sovereignty, he was like, I know what's going to happen. You see, there's a demon-possessed guy on the other side. We're going to go over there and do great ministry, but we got to go through pain first to grow. You see, it's during that season of pain that they're going to grow. It's through that season of pain that they're going to encounter me. It's through that season of pain that their faith is going to grow because on the mountaintop, they're not as strong as they think they are. They're not as smart as they think they are. They don't understand what they will only understand in a season of pain. Guys, I want to encourage you this year, the last 18 months that we experienced, He is still God and still sits on the throne. 
It may have been painful, but there, I got to tell you, I grew in ways I never thought I would grow. The truth is, man, I dove into the word like I never did because just like you guys, I'm like, is this it? Like, is this the end? Read the signs of the time, right? My eyes are opening and Man, I grew spiritually. I grew as a husband. I grew as a father. We became better stewards of our finances. Our heart for others grew. People are suffering, and we served. And you served. And you grew. Some of us lost family members. And you went through grief. And through the grief and the pain, you grew. It's not that we pulled something off well. It's not that I did. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit through our lives. It's the promises of God. You see, the world's going to go through pain, guys. Whether you are a believer or not, you're going to go through the same storms, but you don't sit in the same boat. You see, for the believer, there's a promise the unbeliever doesn't have. When the world goes through pain and you don't know God, it just hurts. You don't have a promise of redemption. To the believer who's put their trust in Jesus, man, you have the promise of of new life, of new beginning, of hope, of redemption, that God is going to use that storm you're in for greatness, for you, and for his kingdom. You see, Jesus, he pulled them into a storm knowingly because it's in the storm that there's great discovery and they didn't get what they would only get through a season of pain in their lives. Let's jump to verse 38. Let's go back there. And Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion and the disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if I drown? Let me tell you guys, I was on Lake Ontario once salmon fishing. I love fishing. How many people love fishing? All right, a few of you. You guys are cool. Rest of you, eh. No, so fishing is awesome. I, I just, I enjoy it so much. So I, I try to go up to Lake Ontario um, every year, right? Go salmon fishing and Lake Ontario is like the ocean. Like this thing is massive. And uh, it was my brother-in-law's, um, it was his bachelor party, right? So I'm a Christian. So a bachelor party for me, you get on a boat, you go fishing. Like that's the way we do it, right? And you pray and you worship God and it's wonderful. So I get out and I notice the wind is picking up before we go. But I'm like, you know what? I drove this guy up here almost four hours. We're going to get out on this water, and we're going to catch some fish. How many of you know being stubborn sometimes is not to your advantage? I knew better, but I had something to prove. So we get out on the water. We go about five to seven miles offshore. We start trolling. And, you know, it was one, two-footers, and it was uncomfortable. And my brother-in-law, or actually I should say my my wife's brother-in-law was my brother-in-law, right? So he starts getting a little seasick, and he's like, is this okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is fine. This is normal. (laughs) I don't know if I lied. God forgive me. It is normal for wind. And then all of a sudden, it started really picking up. And I I couldn't see the horizon anymore because the waves were bigger than the boat. And by the time I'm like, all right, I'm not stubborn anymore. God, help us. Like, I started praying. I started praying. And they were like, are we going to be okay? And I was like, I'm the captain. He's, he's like, you're the captain. And I was like, I don't know. I think we should pray, guys. It was so terrifying. And I cried out to God. And by the God's grace, I'm here today. We made it home. And I rode every wave top there. So I can imagine what these guys were in. Man, I cried out to God. If he was in that boat, I would have certainly uh, tried to wake him up as well. But it's interesting that Jesus was sleeping, wasn't it? You ever consider that? So interesting that he was sleeping. And and I noticed that hope did not enter me when I was on that boat crying out because of my, uh, I'll say, stupidity and my stubbornness. I started to knock. Right? I was good salmon fishing until I got scared. The moment I got scared, I'm like, Jesus. I know you're there. You're the God of my storm. You're the God of this storm. Wake up. (laughs) And all of a sudden, with the fear was also peace. I experienced the peace in that moment that surpassed understanding. I still didn't know if I was going to live or die, but I knew I would be with the Lord in glory. So I was like, amen. You know, and I recognized in the story that Jesus was sleeping, and and I had to really sit there and pray about that. And it brought me back to that story. and, And I think this is the point. They needed to use their faith. You see, if things were okay, I'm not going to seek God. You see, the beauty of the storm, the beauty of the hardship, is that it makes you run to God. It makes you knock. It makes you seek. What does Scripture say? If you knock, the door will be open. If you seek, you shall find. Right? That's what Scripture says. And it's in the power of your storm that you're to run to God. Look, you guys have been in a storm just like me. Some of you were. Some of you lost family members because of this crazy pandemic. And when life gets hard, when life gets tough, who and what do you run to? 
Who and what do you run to? If you're not running to God for hope, you're not going to receive a promise. Notice what happened when they ran to Jesus and they shook him and they're like, don't you care about us? Wake up. Jesus woke up. And what did he do in response to their faith? In response to their knock, Jesus went out and he said, wind, be still. You see, some of us lack the miracle we're looking for because we're not seeking God. What does it mean to seek God? It means to just open your heart. And it means to say, Jesus, you're where my hope comes from. My hope doesn't come from career and college and all those things or relationships. God, God, it comes from you. And I don't know how this thing's going to turn out, God. But I know you're good. And I know you got me. And here's the truth of, of these apostles. All but one of them were persecuted for their faith. Every one of them died following Jesus. And yet he's still good. Because there's a goodness that surpasses understanding. There's a hope and a peace that is only found in God. Because here's the truth. This is a time in history where most people died from the flu. If you had a fever, it could kill you. Listen, they, they, they lived very different than you and I. They lived every moment understanding death could happen at any time. You see, some of us, we, we try to hold on to these things we think we have too tight. We th and we think too little about eternity. We think too small about eternity. When in reality, your career, you got to work. I got to put food on the table. If I don't work, my wife and kids, they're not going to eat. That's kind of messed up, right? But it's when we put our hope in those things. Some of us pay too much of our mind to our career, to our college, to our education. We put too much value on those things, thinking they're going to do for you what only God can. It's a distraction. And the beauty of the storm is it stopped the distraction. The apostles are like, hey, we're walking with this great teacher. Hey, we're walking with this guy who raises the dead. We're cool by association. But they really understood who he was when they found themselves in a storm. Guys, don't waste your pain. Don't waste it. Don't waste your storm. Don't waste the hardship that you're in. Because here's, what, here's a promise from Scripture, 1 Peter 5.10 after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you have suffered a little while. So many of us are like, God, take me out of my misery. God, take me out of my problems. And we, we focus so much about the rescue. And God is like, no, I'm allowing that. God's good. He doesn't make bad things happen. We live in a fallen world. He's like, no, I'm allowing that because that season has to do a work in you and a lesson in your life you're not getting any other way. After you've suffered a little while, you will grow, you will mature, you will see God, you will understand God. You're going to experience his love and his mercy. Look, when I was a baby Christian, I knew God was good, and I knew Jesus saved me cerebrally. He's the redeemer of my soul. But I didn't have a testimony. I had, I had knowledge. But it was in a moment of deep pain that all of a sudden Jesus became real to me. And, and, and it became a testimony that glorifies God today because I met Jesus in, in a storm. Who do you turn to right now as we face these rising COVID numbers, Right? Possibly World War III, a crazy economy. Did you guys watch TikTok? People are scared. <laughs> like, seriously, they brought, this is how scared they are. They brought Blue's Clues back, okay? The dude is like, I, I got a letter, right? That kind of thing. Like, seriously, people are scared. Who and what do you run to? I want to encourage you that God, he hasn't left you. Scripture says he will never forsake you. Scripture says that no one will take you from the palm of his hand, but you have to make a decision to be in the palm of his hand, which means open my heart and say, God, I need you. You as a believer have to make a decision to abide in the palm of his hand. You know how many times as a Christian I may have been positioned in the palm of his hand because of Jesus' work, but I allow my anxiety, my thoughts, and my fears to take me emotionally out of the palm of his hand? I may be saved, but I live like a, like a scaredy cat. I lived anxious, I lived worried, just consumed with everything that was going on in this world. What does it mean to abide? It means when I'm scared, I run to his name. It means when life is hard, I pray. It means I read the word. It means I stand on a promise of God. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, do not grieve. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve, 
for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Th what this doesn't mean, it doesn't mean go hide your emotions. Let's understand that. In the context of the scripture, what, what it's really saying to you is, don't give yourself over to such despair that you have no more hope. Jesus experienced grief in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's not afraid of your feelings, but bring them to God, not to some vice. Bring them to God, not to some person that is your drug, that relationship drug we run to. They ain't going to do it for you. They can't do for you what only God can. You know why I say that so, so, so like, convinced? Because I've been there, done that. And I pray to God he would give me the wisdom never to run to the wrong places again in my life. That's what the cross means to me. It means, as I look at that empty cross because he rose, that's what it symbolizes. Hope, forgiveness, a new life, it, resurrection. My, my situation doesn't end with the period there. It ends with Jesus, right? My situation doesn't end where I think it's going to end. Jesus finishes my story. Jesus finishes your story. So we come to a close in this message. I, I was reading uh, Psalm 84. Uh, it was part of my personal devotion. It wasn't even going to make its way into this message or Easter, and I'm probably going to share it on both. Psalmist David, most people attribute it to David. He's writing this psalm in response to hardship and pain. He's writing this psalm in response to difficulties that you and I go through that he did as a man. And this is what it says. We're going to go to verse 5 of uh, Psalm 84. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. What is the pilgrimage? What is the, the valley of Baca? Valley of Baca literally meant valley of weeping or valley of tears. The pilgrimage is somebody who says in faith, God, I'm going to walk this journey. God, I'm going to walk through this desert of despair, of pain and weeping, and you know what? I'm going to walk through it in hope because I don't walk alone. See, that's the greatest gift you have that, that, that this Good Friday reminds you of, that this cross reminds you of. You don't walk alone. Jesus is not hanging on that cross. He's literally walking with you, and you got to make a decision to say, man, no matter what hardship life brings me to, God, I know you're faithful and just to bring me through it. No matter what this world brings me to, Lord God, I'm willing to walk through this valley of tears because God is good, and I'm going, to see, I'm going to see springs well up, because God is good. And I'm not going to focus on the things that the world focuses on. I'm going to focus on what God is doing, and I recognize where my strength comes from. Strength comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, Scripture says. And how do you receive the strength of the Lord? It's where you place your hope. My hope is not in these gas, gas prices. My hope is not in how this world turns out. My hope is in Jesus' story. My hope is in his resurrection. My hope is in his payment for sin. My hope is in this book of Revelation that we're working through in our message series right now. Like my hope is in Jesus. He's going to restore everything. He's going to make all the wrongs in your life right. Everyone who's hurt you who hasn't turned to God, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Do you know God's going to fight your battles? Yeah. Like, I'm off the hook. I don't have to fight anymore. Yeah. I don't have to work so hard anymore. All is I got to do is be loved and love freely. Jesus set you free, amen. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us. And if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.